So we'll go on to our second talk by Professor Orna Elroy Stein, Stein, that will tell us about the story of Sigma-1 receptor identification as a potential target, as a potential drug target for the treatment of elongation factor 2 beta leukodystrophy. Please, Orna. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the organizing committee, for the invitation and for the opportunity to tell you our story. Um, EF2B leukodystrophy. This is also called vanishing white matter disease, or for short, VWM disease. This is a recessive uh, neurodegenerative, very rare disease uh, due to mutations in either of the five genes that encode for the five subunits of the EIF2B. This is translation initiation factor. So uh, the disease is manifested by loss of CNS, uh, white matter, loss of uh, motor and mental uh, functions, and it des deteriorates uh, upon physiological stress, uh, and the death is around uh, early teens. Uh, the disease is diagnosed by MRI. You can see here that the loss of the white matter is in both hemispheres. And here you can uh, see a postmortem brain and can see the very heavy loss of white matter. So, um, since EF2B is a translation initiation factor, I'll briefly give you a reminder of translation initiation in eukaryotes. So another uh, translation initiation factor called EIF2 in its GTP bound form binds methionine tRNA, the initiator, to form a ternary complex. And this ternary complex is loaded on the 40S ribosomal subunit. And following a linear scanning along the 5' UTR, untranslated region, it leads to AUG recognition. Upon AOG recognition, the GTP is hydrolyzed, and EIF2 GDP is released from the ribosome, and then recycled back to EIF2 GTP by EIF2B. So we are talking here about EIF2B, which is a guanine exchange factor of EIF2. And this is a major regulator of protein synthesis in all eukaryotic cells, and it's highly, highly uh, conserved in evolution. So, upon stress signal, and any kind of stress will activate one of four kinases, depending on the stress, uh, and lead to uh, EIF2 phosphorylation on its alpha subunit. And by doing that, it changes the EIF2, B, EIF2 uh, from a substrate to an inhibitor of EIF2B. And this leads actually to partial and transient EIF2B inhibition which elicits a whole uh, trans a transcription program or expression program, which is known as integrated stress response, or for short, ISR. So the phosphorylated EIF2 inhibits EIF2B, as I said, and this leads to attenuation of global translation on one hand, but counterintuitively, it leads to translation activation of mRNAs with an uh, upstream open reading frame burdened five prime untranslated regions. So there are many of them, but ATF4 mRNA is the most studied one, and ATF4 uh, encodes for a transcription factor. And the transcription factor transactivates some target genes, uh, which are rescue genes in most of the cases. And, the, and, and then GAD34 is also one of the targets, which leads back to dephosphorylation of EIF2, and the ISR is terminated. So we learned from here that partial loss of EIF2B activity actually affects the translation rate of each mRNA depending on its FIFA UTR, which means that EIF2B mutations actually cause imbalance of gene expression regulation, and vanishing white matter disease is actually a disease of the translation system. Uh, and the problem, the, the problem is in each and every cell type. 
But the CNS glial cells are the most sensitive ones, and this was a mystery for a long time, but I think uh, we solved it, and I'll tell you later on why astrocytes and oligodendrocytes are the most sensitive cell types to ef 2 b mutations. So in order to study the disease, we developed a knock-in mouse model uh, by introducing a vanishing white matter mutation into the genome. And here is the phenotype of our mouse model, the homozygote mouse. First, it leads to 20% decrease in EF2B activity in the brain. This is very small decrease, but gives a lot of problems. Uh, it leads to delayed and abnormal brain development, as we saw by MRI studies. It leads to abnormal abundance and function of glial cells. It leads to motor function impairments, as we did the rotorod assay. It leads to early neurodegeneration. These are electron microscopy experiments. It leads to poor recovery from cuprison-induced demyelination and to impaired potency of glial cells to execute the inflammatory response. And also to age and brain region dependent abnormalities in brain transcriptome. So this is the transcriptome. You can see a very clear signature between, I mean, when the brain has a mutated EF2B. So in order to understand what's going on with the proteome, how this mutation affects really the proteome of the brain, we decided to take brain at two different time points along the recovery from the caprison-mediated demyelination. So here you see that the wild type will recover really nicely, the mutant will not. And we took these samples from here, these two time points, and we checked the upregulation or downregulation of each and every protein in the brain in these two phenotypes, uh, genotypes. And the analysis uh, revealed a very interesting uh, phenomenon that EF2B mutation affects the abundance of some, but not all, of the subunits of electron transfer chain complexes in the mitochondria. So you see here the electron transfer chain complexes, complex one, two, three, four, and the ATP synthase. All of them are made by 96 subunits. Most of them are encoded by the nucleus. 13 of them only are encoded by the mitochondrial genome. And each and every circle here in the complexes represent a protein which the abundance of which is uh, abnormal in the mutant cells. So mitochondria bio biogenesis is actually a coordinated process of gene expression from two genomes. So as I said, most of the mitochondrial proteins, uh, genes, there are about 1,000 genes are encoded by the nuclear genome. Only 13 mRNAs are encoded by the mitochondria genome, and they encode for subunits of the ETC complexes. So it re, uh, it's very important that the translation in the cytoplasm of all these genes will be highly coordinated with the translation within the mitochondria. So the translation machinery of the mitochondria is also encoded by the nuclear genome. So this means all the translation, initiation, elongation, and termination factors, and all the mitochondrial ribosomes, uh, ribosomal proteins, are encoded by the nuclear genome. So these are all dependent on EF2B activity in the cytoplasm. So our proteomic uh, approach, the quantitative uh, mass spec experiment revealed also a spectrum of positive and negative fold change values of mitochondrial ribosomal proteins, MRPs. You see here the large ribosomal subunit, the small ribosomal subunit of the mitochondria. Uh, and, we has, and we saw significant change in abundance of uh, five MRPLs like that, and uh, we thought, okay, maybe there is a problem in the mitochondrial translation machinery. And indeed, that was the case. We did some uh, S35 methionocysteine incorporation assays in the presence of emetin, which is a specific inhibitor of the cytoplasmic translation machinery. 
And we discovered that indeed, in the EF2B mutant cells, there is less translation per mitochondrial mass in the mitochondria. So we came up with this model. Uh, when EF2B is functioning well, which means 100% activity, there is a normal level of ternary complex in the cell, the mRNA translation is normal, everything is fine, and this leads to normal level of individual proteins and also balanced composition of multi-subunit complexes. And this leads to normal cell performance. However, when if 2 b is mutated, and we are talking here about loss of function mutation, these are partial loss of function mutations, uh, this, the ternary complex level is low, lowered, and this uh, leads to specific 5 prime mutation dependence effect on translation, and it leads to imbalanced composition of multi-subunit uh, complexes. And these are the ETC complexes in the mitochondria because of unbalanced translation of the nuclear encoded genes and also of the mitochondrial encoded genes because of unbalanced expression of the mitochondrial ribosomal proteins. So if to be actually is a major coordinator of cytoplasmic and mitochondrial translation, and this was a very, very important uh, discovery. So we checked it uh, also enzymatically to see if indeed there is less oxidative phosphorylation and as well, I mean, the ETC complex one activity and ETC complex four activity, both of them are lower down in the mutant cells. And uh, another thing that we saw and we were puzzled by that is that there is an increase in the mitochondrial abundance in EF2B mutant cells. And we thought, okay, maybe this is a compensatory response to uh, compensate for the energy need of the cell. Uh, and uh, so let me tell you now the differences in the sensitivities of different cell types to the EF2B mutation. In primary MEFs, the increased mitochondrial abundance fully compensate of energy needs. And how do we know that? because and here we used oxygen consumption rate uh, measurement by the seahorse technology. And we see here that if we uh, see the basal respiration, the maximal respiration, and the ATP-linked respiration, all of these are lower down in the um, uh, mutant cells, but if we check it per mitochondrial mass. But if we take into account the induced biogenesis of mitochondria, and we check it uh, per cell, we see the, that the oxygen consumption rate normalizes. And the cells don't need to enhance glycolysis. Here we see the extracellular acidification rate per cell. It's normal. No need to uh, enhance it because the fibroblasts do not suffer from any clinical symptoms in the patients, so everything is fine. However, in contrast, in primary astrocytes, we see an increased abundance of mitochondria, even more than in primary MEFs. But this is not enough because oxygen consumption rate per cell is low, much low in the mutant cells, both for basal respiration, maxal respiration, and ATP-dependent linked respiration. And it's not enough because the glycolysis increases as well. So uh, astrocytes are definitely more sensitive than fibroblasts to EF2B mutations. And we know that astrocytes' performance is defective in vanishing white matter patients. So this actually explains uh, why uh, the mutations prim primarily affect the CNS glial cells, the white matter. Because it's known that a major function of astrocytes is coupled to energy metabolism. Uh, there is a lot of metabolic cooperation between astrocytes and neurons and astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And also for oligodendrocytes, it's known that their differentiation from oligodendrocytes precursor cells to mature myelinating oligodendrocytes uh, and the entire myelination process is highly dependent on mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. 
So then we ask ourselves, can we use this uh, increased mitochondrial content feature as a cellular assay for drug screening? So this feature really is very simple. It's not a sophisticated uh, assay, but I really like the concept of simplicity. Uh, and the answer was yes, we used single cell analysis of MEFs, primary MEFs, and we stained them for mitochondrial abundance. Uh, uh, and we used ROS, uh, reactive oxygen species, as a proxy for mitochondrial abundance, because this is a good one in this case. And as you can see here, there is larger, the larger proportion of the mutant MEFs contain high ROS level. So we asked ourselves, okay, maybe we can take these mutants and screen for drugs, and hopefully we can see reduced mitochondrial content, which might indicate lack of compensatory response uh, due to the repair oxidative phosphorylation. So Andrea in my lab uh, did these experiments uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Hanor Sandorovich from bar -Ilan. And uh, what Andrea did, uh, she plated EF2B mutant primary MEFs and uh, incubated them with drug-like molecules and then uh, stained for f with fluorescent dyes, uh, ROS detectors, and then data acquisition by the in-cell analyzer with the kind help of uh, Professor Miguel Weil and uh, Dr. Leo Solmensky. And we did the, the single-cell analysis of fluorescence intensity and actually, uh, Andrea finalized the uh, six of the seven steps of this uh, project. So first step was to find an assay. So I told you about this. And second step was to choose the library, the drug-like molecules library. And this was done uh, by Hanor Senderovich with his uh, algorithms. He took all these considerations of chemical uh, structure and pharmacological features and the diversity of all the library that are available now. And he came up with uh, the solution that the Cambridge uh, Diverse Set Expression Library is the best one for us. Uh, this library contains uh, 50,000 uh, compounds. And then we, we didn't want to screen 50,000 compounds and to purchase the library, very expensive. So we asked uh, Hanoch to cluster the, the 50,000 compounds to 500 clusters. And uh, he did that. And we have here one compound per cluster that represents between one to 2,025 compounds. So we screened the 500 compounds. Uh, eight hits came up. Uh, we open up the eight hits, and they uh, actually uh, represent 437 different compounds. And then Andrea uh, screened them and came up with 21 hits. The 21 hits then uh, were uh, screened again and again and again. You know, we really wanted to see that it's, it works well. And then she did some um, toxicity assays, and we came up with uh, the hero. The hero is PAG5. This is the name, the, pla the place on the plate. It's not the chemical name. Uh, but this was the hero, and we really wanted to know what is the protein target. So what Andrea did, she uh, just went to the side finder uh, and uh, looked for the structure, I mean similarity of other known drugs that they known with known targets. Maybe some of them is similar to the structure of PAG5, and luckily she found that it's very similar to the structure of a drug that is known as sigma-1 receptor binder. Uh, so we were thrilled about it, and we immediately checked uh, if PAG5 binds sigma-1 receptor, and it does in vitro. Uh, and sigma-1 receptor was identified as a good target. Uh, so the, this PAG5 is our lead compound now. So what is sigma-1 receptor? Sigma-1 receptor uh, sits on the uh, ER membrane. 
very close to the mitochondria membrane, so it's uh, called MAM, mito-associated membrane. And actually, it's a chaperone. It binds to many, many targets. It's called receptor, but it's not a receptor. It's a chaperone. And it is involved in many uh, cellular functions, such as oligodendrocytes differentiation and myelin information and astrocyte activation and ER stress response and ER2 mitochondria calcium flux, everything very, uh, it's very, very relevant to vanishing white matter disease. So this was really uh, a great thing. So we immediately checked the uh, level of sigma-1 receptor in the EF2B mutant cells. Indeed, it's low in mutant MEFs and even lower in mutant astrocytes. So luckily and happily, uh, the binders of sigma-1 receptors are beneficial for EF2B mutant cells. Here you see mitochondrial abundance per cell. So in untreated mutants, there is high abundance, but a, an agonist, known agonist, which is the name of which is predopidin, lowers it. And PHE5, our lead compound, lowers it even more. Uh, ATP level per mitochondria is increased, predopidin increases it, and PAG5 increases it even more. Uh, if we talk about basal oxygen consumption rate, you see here that the mutant has less consumption if they are not treated. An antagonist of sigma-1 receptor even lowers it more. Another agonist, known agonist, enhances it a bit. Predopidin enhances it even more, and PAG5 is a real hero. It enhances it very, very efficiently. And this is true also for ATP-linked oxygen consumption rate per mitochondria. And PAG5 protects EF2B mutant cells from ER stress-mediated cell death. Here you see that the mutants are dying faster than wild types if they are not treated. If they are treated with PAG5, they behave as very similar to wild-type cells. So to summarize, EF2B is a major coordinator of energy metabolism, and this actually explains why EF2B mutation leads to white matter disease. Uh, vanishing white matter is a disease of the translation machinery, actually, and translation regulatory system specifically. And glial cells seem to be the most sensitive cells. And a drug string identified a small compound, which we term PAG5, that increases the mitochondrial health of EF2B mutant cells. Uh, and P uh, PAG5 was identified as sigma-1 receptor binder, and EF2B mutant astrocytes express low level of sigma-1 receptor, but PAG5 and other known sigma-1 receptor agonists correct the phenotype of EF2B mutant cells. So I would like to thank the, all the students that were involved in all this uh, vanishing white matter disease research in my lab, past and present student, Andrea did the screen, and uh, all the collaborators and the finding agencies. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thanks. So, how come a uh, ubiquitously expressed uh, gene that is so vital when uh, mutated causes uh, such a specific uh, malfunction? So, we actually, this is the reason I wanted to work on vanishing white matter disease because this is really a mystery. How come? You know, EF2B is essential for each and every cell type, and the disease is only restricted to the brain and not to the brain, to the white matter of the brain. So, this is a very interesting issue. And since EF2B is a translation initiation factor, it means that we are talking here about a translation regulation problem. So uh, we wanted to work on it in order to find a translation regulation in the brain and to specifically for myelin formation and maintenance. And I think now we know that the glial cells, specifically astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, they are highly, highly, highly dependent 
on metabolism, on energy production. They need a lot of ATP, a lot more than any other cell type. And the, the coordination between translation in the cytoplasm and the mitochondria, which was discovered here, is crucial, really crucial for uh, glial cells. So maybe even just a bit more specific on this issue of specificity, you take this, you know, regulatory element which is very general to everything that the cell does, and you mentioned that only those complexes that are related to the mitochondria, if I remember correctly, about 13 proteins or 13 complexes are affected by a mutation, but I, I would expect any complex to be affected, right? right? So in the protein level, not in the cell level, I would expect all the enzymatic complexes, for example, or even, I don't know, ribosomal complexes, Mm -hmm. to be destroyed. So what's the specificity in the 5 prime UTR that EF2B is be so selective about? Okay, so first to answer your question, you are right, absolutely right, because we discovered also that that proteasome is suffering. And there is a proteasome uh, in kind of inhibition, not inhibition, but it doesn't work very well in EF2B uh, mutant cells. But the second issue that I wanted to mention to you that the 5 prime UTR you know, it's different from uh, mRNA to mRNA. So when the ternary complex level lowers down a bit, some uh, translate, this translation of some mRNAs will be affected and others will not be affected. And this is a very, very delicate issue. So some complexes will suffer, some others will not suffer, and it depends on the cell type also. So in the brain, probably a lot is going on and we don't know all the answers.